Uh, Dr. Ray, you can be make yourself a presenter. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, just need to be certain. Like, uh, do you want me to start the presentation now or? Uh, Dr. Ray, are you yeah. there? Welcome, uh, Dr. Shanbag Minod Shanbag, who's chairman of NISTI, mm -hmm. North India Section of Textile Institute, UK. He is also there. So uh, I would like uh, Dr. Shanbag uh, and somebody from TIT to begin with opening opening remarks. So uh, Dr. Mukesh, Dr. Mukesh, uh, Dr. Tyagi, uh, we are trying to be the come. You are waiting for that. Mm, I think Dr. Shanba can start uh, with the introduction of her this activity, and uh, I hope by that time they will join in. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Dr. Shanba, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, as chairman of uh, HT. North India section of the Textile Institute UK. Uh, I am very pleased to offer you this uh, webinar by Dr. Sumit Ray of IIT Mandi in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, this is the second in the series of uh, webinars being organized uh, jointly between uh, DIT Mandi and uh, as part of their memorandum of understanding of, of joint activity has been in uh, uh, in effect uh, since a year and a half. Uh, previously, we were involved in physical uh, activity, but in the present circumstances, when physical activities are not possible, we have uh, uh, taken the help of uh, the virtual process, the digital process. And it is a great pleasure uh, on the second occasion today to have you all uh, join us at this time. Uh, Dr. Ray, of course, is well known in his field, and uh, I will leave it to Mr. Shaidesh Kaushik, who is the main organizer uh, uh, of the content uh, of these webinars, uh, to introduce him and to explain to him very brief, explain to all of you very briefly uh, what to expect from this presentation. I am thankful to PIT for the uh, support and organization, particularly uh, Dr. Mukesh Kumar, who has been uh, the stellar force uh, behind the PIT uh, uh, in the PIT IT department uh, behind this webinar effort. Uh, just in brief, as you might be aware, but just to bring you up, uh, the Textile Institute UK is the world's uh, largest. A professional body of technical professionals spanning the uh, clothing, textile clothing and footwear industry, uh, what we can say the appearance industry. Uh, and uh, we in India are part of the four sections that make up the membership in India. Uh, NISTI, the North India section, is the largest among the four sections in the country and is also the most active with a variety of activities. Uh, uh, which engage its members among various stakeholders in the textile industry. Uh, I will be happy if uh, members in this audience uh, express interest in the textile group by joining its membership. Uh, and I would be happy to welcome you to this. For the present, do enjoy the lecture that uh, Dr. Ray is going to give you. And I'm thankful to Dr. Ray for agreeing to uh, be part of this webinar series uh, and presenting the second in the webinar series. Thank you very much and enjoy yourself. Uh, thank you, friends. I'll very briefly introduce Dr. Ray and I'll also request him to say a few lines about his profile and uh, domain expertise. And, uh, Lecture it's in current context, uh, uh, textiles, non ones, uh, yeah. spun, man blown, spun have acquired a great significance. 
Dr. Ray's work is uh, related to this field only, especially in terms of electro spinning and nanoscale non woven, which are enhancing functionality of medical textile masks, etc., to a great extent. Uh, so that electro spinning and uh, nano uh, scale non ones will be the mainstay of his current lecture. I would now invite Dr. Ray to to, to deliver, deliver his lecture, and before that, uh, very giving a very brief introduction about himself, his domain expertise, and a snapshot of the lecture. And Dr. Ray, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Shilishi, and thank you, Dr. Shanwag, uh, for introducing me. Uh, I mean, as uh, as uh, Shilishi has uh, you know explained it, I expertise mostly my expertise is mostly on electro spinning, uh, making nanofibers and using them for different applications. So, I, uh, so I, uh, now I just uh, I'll start from the very you know beginning of it. I did my uh, BTEC uh, from Jadavpur University from uh, in mechanical engineering, and then I transferred uh, to to uh, to United States. I got transferred to, uh, to uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, where I did my PhD. Uh, and uh, luckily, my advisor was uh, Professor Alexander Yarin, who has his seminal article on uh, electro spinning theory. So you can you can uh, say it like I learned from the best, uh, and uh, from there I developed uh, the uh, the research knack and uh, mostly the research based on application of polymer nanofibers in heat and mass transfer uh, uh, domain. So uh, in mass transfer I mostly work on air and water purification, and in heat transfer I work in in uh, removing heat using. Uh, polymer nano architecture from a microelectronic component. Apart from that, I also work on energy, uh, alternate energy. Uh, very, I mean, uh, it's a it's a great uh, time to actually. Uh, I mean, it's not a very great time nationally, but it's a great time to invest um, heavily uh, and both in research and in industry in polymer nanofibers. Uh, given the fact that uh, the non wovens, especially the nano non wovens, are uh, taking a uh, taking a large leap uh, in the Indian uh, in, the, in the Indian context and also in the global context as well. So, just as a as a you know as a uh, brief, what I do, what I'm currently doing right now is practically I am making. Uh, I, I do hope that you get to see uh, that I'm just making these masks. So, this is what my research is. Uh, the inner layer, as you can see, the smaller uh, thinner layer that we have. Uh, that makes this uh, really inefficient do surgical mask um, uh, into a very efficient uh, uh, mask. This is about 99.2% efficient uh, filter in ambient air. Uh, and in ambient air, we have various size scale of particles from 10 nanometer all the way to 10 micron. Uh, so this mask is efficient below 3 micron, about 99.2%. And all is because of this very thin a uh, nanofiber layer that is there inside this white layer you can see so uh, uh, so this is what i make i make uh, i tailor them uh, based on the based on the requirement i uh, then apply them based on the domain uh, i work in water filtration as well very recently we have developed uh, a membrane using biopolymers uh, and that uh, you know same nanofibers with biopolymers you can use it for air you can use it for water so there are different applications. So uh, now, you know, going to the going to this to this talk. Uh, so what I will do, I will talk about you know uh, the basics of uh, you know the um, the um, uh, how do I how do I put, uh, how do I put it? It's like the basics of uh, of stretching the polymer and making nanofiber out of it. So uh, often, often cases we do uh, restrict ourselves in either following certain protocol or following certain uh, certain nomenclature that has been developed, following certain uh, design that has been developed, and just the industrial practice. But often cases, we forget about the very basics of how a polymer can be stretched and why a polymer can be, uh, should be stretched. Uh, and then the point is, how can you tweak stretching it? So this is what we are, I'm going to talk about today. 
uh, about the geological behavior of polymers. Uh, very basic term of it is the viscoelasticity of the polymers, solution or on, on milk, and how to use them in electro spinning, uh, where I do heavily rely on for my research. So how do we um, how do we understand electro spinning from the very basics of this viscoelastic or the viscoelasticity? And then how can we use them for different applications? So I have already shown you one application, which I am, which I am currently having in my hand. Uh, and there are many more like that. Um, uh, a filter mask, uh, you know, face mask is one. There can be drug delivery, tissue engineering, cell culture, and lot many. So this is what I'm going to talk uh, briefly uh, uh, during, my, during my presentation. I would very much like to have the interaction at the end of the presentation, uh, and I would really like to have it uh, because uh, you know the, the um, it would be better to have an inter inter uh, to an interaction rather than just a lecture. So I hope the the students who are here would take this. You know, uh, probably they would learn something from here, and I would I would get to learn something from you as well because I'm not a textile engineer; I'm just a mechanical engineer. Uh, so. Uh, I do believe that I'll get to learn a lot from you after this after this uh, uh, seminar. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, if you can just uh, raise the volume, thoda sa jor se bolen, uh, so better rahega. I will try to talk as loud as possible. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank uh, you. I mean, voice, voice is clear from uh, Ray side. Thik hai, sir. Thik hai. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, because it's going to be about like in uh, 45 minutes of it and, you know, shouting at the top of my voice probably would crack it. Yes, so, yes. Anyway, uh, so whenever, uh, you know, you, all, everyone is ready, I, uh, you know, I'd like, uh, I'd like to go on with the presentation. Yes, so you can start it now. Okay, okay. So uh, please do let me know if uh, anybody doesn't get to see the slides, you know, uh, and if there is any problem or any glitch happening from my end. Okay, so I'll be sharing the entire. Uh, sir, I'm in backend. I will look at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to confirm, can anybody uh, like? Is there anyone who cannot see the uh, see the uh, 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 see the screen. Screen is coming, sir. Uh, is the presentation visible to everyone? Yes, sir, visible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so as I as I have mentioned, uh, you know, uh, so I'll be talking about porous polymer fiber membrane, um, and the the talk will will uh, encircle mostly about the nanofibers, uh, about the hows and whys. So first, I'll start with the whys, uh, why nanofiber or why porous polymer nanofiber, and then uh, you know a brief about how to make this porous polymer nanofiber and where we can use them. Well, um, so this is how I will base my presentation. I will talk about a little bit of the advantages of the of these membranes, uh, and then we will talk about the polymer, polymer viscoelasticity, and a most important thing, uh, Deborah number. And then we'll differentiate between melt blowing and and electro spinning. Melt blowing is, uh, I mean, uh, you are at, uh, you are entirely uh, textile uh, uh, oriented. You have an entirely textile oriented program, so you probably will be knowing much more better than me about melt blowing. So it's just, uh, you know, with electro spinning, um, I'm quite certain that the nitty gritties of it, you are aware. I'll still try to uh, shed some light on that. Well, uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, uh, when we're using membrane, uh, and often cases when we think about a membrane, we think about a filtration. Uh, no, the very first thing that comes into our mind. And we have uh, different kind of membranes. We have these microfilter membrane, we have RO, uh, we have ultrafilter membrane. Uh, the, the best part of having these, you know, these different kind of membranes is that um, they have uh, the, the, uh, the capability of ours is to, to tweak the porous architecture uh, and a huge surface area. 
Well, when you have a fiber membrane, which is a little bit different than, than the regular RO membrane, uh, the, the positive part of it is that the surface area increases drastically. And in terms of filtration, in terms of uh, in terms of catalytic activities, in terms of interaction between uh, a react between two reactants like the membrane and a reactant like anything else like iron or particle or gas or anything, you mostly require a large surface area. And uh, for the fiber, for, for these fiber uh, architecture, this uh, volume to uh, the surface area to volume ratio is actually very large. Well, uh, the, the uh, very fact is that, uh, you know, uh, if you have a one centimeter size of a cube, and then if you, uh, so you have a volume of one centimeter cube. Now, if you, st if you start cutting down it and make a one nanometer size cube, your surface area will increment, it will in increase by like a million times your volume will still be the same, just your surface area will increase. So this surface area increment is practically is, uh, you know, surface area to volume ratio is practically driven by one by L. So L being the characteristic length of it. So if you reduce your characteristic length, in this case, it is a fiber diameter. If you reduce this characteristic length to a drastic level, uh, your surface area will increase dramatically. Okay. Uh, and that would help you a lot. The best part of uh, you know of electrospinning is that you have the ability, you have the capability to tweak this, to tweak the architecture of it, to tweak the uh, fiber size to the pore size and everything inside. Even individual fiber, individual uh, nanofiber architecture, you can also tweak them, like core shell, uh, multi core shell. Uh, you can have um, you know um, uh, you can have porogens inside them, so you can have a porous nanofiber individual porous nanofiber and a porous architecture as well. So uh, the porous polymer fiber membrane has, as I mentioned, multiple uh, uh, advantages. First of all, the high surface area to volume, and then the pore sizes that you can tweak. The other best part of, you know, of making porous polymer fiber membrane is that in the process itself, you can uh, add many things. And these, and these additives, if you tweak it, if you can control your process, you can have them with an individual nanofiber, like nanoclay uh, or silver or you know, antibacterial component or medicine itself, so etc. So there are many things that you can actually blend them. But the best part, which I like most, apart from all of these, is the tortuosity. Uh, now, if you are not familiar with the term tortuosity, I believe it, or most all of you are familiar with it, I'll just still uh, explain it. So a tortuosity is like uh, you know how long your pore, how long your one single pore is throughout the membrane. So uh, if you have a, a paper and if you make a hole into it, you have one single pore, uh, and you know it ends on one side and ends on the other side. Uh, just sorry, starts from one side, ends on the other side, and you can see through it. The best part of an electrospun or a nano architecture porous membrane is that uh, the pores don't end up where you get to see. Uh, it's, it's not like a see-through. Uh, it, it starts from somewhere. It travels many, many times, I mean, several times of its actual physical length. So suppose you have a one millimeter of a thick membrane uh, and you have one pore and that pore can take an easiest path as long as one centimeter or even longer than that. And that means that uh, the fluid, let's say gas or for any water or any oil or something that is coming uh, to the membrane uh, actually has to travel instead of one millimeter, several centimeter. And that uh, enhances the reaction capability. That enhances the uh, capability to absorb or adsorb. And hence, your uh, the membrane becomes more and more um, uh, active, more and more efficient. And with uh, with an electrospun architecture or a nano architecture, a nano uh, porous polymer fiber membrane, uh, the tortuosity becomes a key aspect. Uh, this is kind of an inverse function of your solid of your uh, of your porosity. So your porosity may not may be as same as uh, like a melt blown architecture, but your tortuosity will increase drastically. And that is what a nano architecture does provide. And, uh, and this is a very important aspect. 
However, uh, you know, this all comes at the cost of, of you knowing, or sorry, it's not like a cost. I would rather say this all comes at the, at the, at the point where you know how to control the architecture. And to, in order to know the architecture, you need to know the process behind it. And even before knowing the process behind it, you need to know uh, the science or the, or, the, or the mechanics behind it. So this is what I'm going to talk today about. Well, uh, I mean, um, you guys, you are all more or less familiar with in the application of non-movements. There are plenty. I just have put one picture uh, in, of a car where you can probably see that there are 37 areas where a non-woven can be used. So, so the potential of non-woven is huge. Uh, and if you get down to a nano architecture level, uh, your, uh, your potential will actually increase drastically as well. This is something that is not mentioned here uh, in this picture is if you have an electric vehicle, you can have um, a fuel cell, which has electrode made out of nano non -movements. Well, uh, so this is the same slide practically, uh, you know, the different applications of it in geotextile, in filtration footwear, medical, household, etc. Well, so now I will start with the, uh, with the basics of the polymer and will then go, go to the, uh, you know, the properties of the polymers. Uh, we are all familiar with polymer, poly, many, and mer repeat unit. So mer is a single unit and, uh, you know, many repeating unit makes it polymer. The basics, basic of it is that it has a hydrocarbon chain uh, with single or double bond or triple bond. Uh, so the basic structure is polyethylene and then you, you know, you incorporate many other items and you make PVC or, P or polypropylene, uh, polyvinyl fluoride. Uh, instead of a linear structure, you can have network-like structure, uh, partial network-like structure like polyacrylonitrile. Uh, uh, so generally, in, while we study uh, polymers and we study the effect of viscoelasticity and etc., we generally start with polyethylene because this is a very basic structure. And you can increase the chain, you can increase the density, and your many properties will change. Uh, so these polymers, which I, moved, which I mentioned, they are all thermoplastics, which you can melt and can mold um, and can extrude them, uh, make fibers out of them. Oh, well, with thermosets, it's not that easy, and you cannot melt them. Uh, and most of our polymers that we use, they are all thermoplastics. Uh, so, so the, so the important properties uh, that we need to take into account of uh, is the crystallinity, is the melting temperature, the glass transition temperature, and the molecular weight. Well, uh, the, the point is that if you want to have a membrane, uh, you need many properties in it, right? For, um, I mean, if you increase the percentage crystallinity, you will increase the strength. You'll increase the tensile strength to a drastic level. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, of course, you, I mean, um, if you have a very high melting point, temperature, high melting point uh, polymer, then your operating condition also changes. Uh, but in often cases, uh, uh, I mean, they don't become uh, very good adsorbent. You increase the uh, crystallinity in them, uh, the, uh, the capability of adsorbing within the fibrous architecture. So uh, molecule, water molecule going in within the, uh, uh, within the polymer macromolecule reduces. So, so, this, so there's a trade-off. Uh, you know, you need to you need to have a strengthened you know, have a strengthened architecture, uh, which can which will melt at a uh, you know later temperature. Uh, but you you may have to compromise a little bit on the on the uh, crystallinity or the amorphous uh, uh, aspect. Well, um, crystallinity is something uh, of of a polymer that is uh, that is extremely tricky. Uh, polymer crystallinity is not simple. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's not like a metal. Uh, the fact that uh, a polymer is not 100% crystalline uh, is is just an understatement. Often cases, these polymers are amorphous, as we have seen, as we as we use them. So, uh, a polymer uh, uh, crystallinity is like is is more or less like a noodle, right? Uh, so you will see a domain where you have uh, you have very good alignment and you have this crystalline region. And then in polymers, uh, majority portions are, uh, are completely random. And that is what we call it as amorphous. So when I said noodle, 
uh, you know, the, the image on the right, actually, that's probably a better uh, visualization of a semi-crystalline uh, uh, polymer. Uh, you see, there is there is some some sort of uh, crystallinity, some sort of uh, arrangement visible there. Uh, so this is like so these are noodles are practically crystalline, but as soon as you boil them, uh, you know they lose the the entire structure of it. the the in, the integrity of it is lost, and it starts to behave uh, more like um, more like uh, an amorphous material where uh, they are now in a flowing condition, so they can flow easily. So uh, if you if you have if you increase the temperature once you go beyond glass transition temperature, uh, uh, this flowing becomes very easy. Now in majority cases in polypropylene, uh, like you use these um, milk bottles or you know you use the uh, curd uh, bottles or you know, jugs, uh, you take it out from the freezer and it's still uh, flexible even though it was at, my, at, 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 at a very low temperature, it's because of the fact that the glass transition where a material starts to behave more like rubber, it starts to flow, uh, is, uh, you know, the chain ar arrangement starts to, starts to disorient themselves. Um, uh, they are at, at minus 100 degrees centigrade, or minus, uh, uh, at about minus 100 to minus 30 degrees centigrade. So, uh, so in, real, in real condition, they're always beyond glass transition temperature. So then again, the, then, then this glass transition temperature becomes very important in the processing condition. Uh, so if you need to flow a polymer uh, before extruding it, you have to operate beyond the glass transition temperature. So, um, so, so once, you know, once you have made a very good crystalline uh, structure, um, uh, you have extruded the polymer very slowly, you have taken a polymer melt and you have extruded it very slowly, allowed the nuclei to, to grow in a crystalline fashion uh, and you attain as much as high uh, crystallinity possible, your strength will increase, your, your uh, ductility will reduce to a very large uh, extent. Uh, now, if you have uh, you know, a low, sufficiently low enough trans glass transition temperature, um, it gives you enough opportunity to make as crystalline as possible of a, of a, uh, of a fiber membrane. Now, when you increase this, uh, when you increase the stretching, when you increase the stretching ratio, uh, you and you start to make nanofibers. Uh, actually, a very bad thing happens in terms of crystallinity. You do not allow the nuclei to grow, uh, and you do it in an adiabatic fashion. Whereas, to grow a good crystalline material, you need to have more or less like an isothermal condition. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain later, but just a brief uh, introduction, brief, brief info over here is that in electrospun nanofibers, you will actually have lesser crystalline structure than in a melt blown condition because melt blown is more isothermal condition than, uh, than uh, electrospinning or than melt spinning if there is no uh, associated hot air flowing there. So, uh, so the thing is now, right now is that. Uh, what to do? Like you, you, you want to have a you have a fiber architecture which is in nanoscale. Uh, now you have to uh, you know you have to get rid of a bit of you know crystallinity uh, because you need uh, the architecture itself. But need you will gain uh, in the in the ductility. So in often cases, what people try to do, especially in the food packaging, uh, they they incorporate fibrous architecture uh, in a in, in a very in a highly crystalline. Uh, polymer um, uh, polymer substrate, uh, and they gain the ductility uh, in terms of the polymer nanofiber and gain the strength in terms of the uh, in terms of the matrix, which is highly crystalline. So uh, now, of course, you once you have high molecular weight, if you have branching, uh, like you have hydrogen bonds to to too many hydrogen bonds, or you have bulky side groups, your melting temperature, glass transition temperature will increase. Uh, and as your glass transition temperature increases to a very high level, uh, you know, your chances of making uh, all these uh, slow extrusion, high crystalline uh, fiber actually starts to reduce. But then again, uh, what is our requirement? If our requirement is nanofiber, we probably will be able to still get rid of few things and we can incorporate elements like nanoclay or, you know, um, uh, or, or cellulose or something like that to which can act as a nucleus uh, while we extrude uh, while we extrude them. Uh, 
and can have um, uh, polymer crystallinity increased over time, or even we can do that in post heat treatment process as well. Well, uh, now the thing is that once we get to know the, uh, the um, chemical properties or the physical properties, uh, the important aspect of, of it is, you know, uh, what we have in our hands. Like, can we, can we change something in the process and and then have the have the and then have the uh, you know final uh, or uh, final fiber or nanofiber? Um, well, I have you know drawn Kevlar over here, uh, so which means that you know these polymers can be extended to a large extent. Um, yeah, even though it may seem like a little discontinuous over here, the concern is that polymers can be drawn to a very fine arch structure. The same polymer, which you know with one process may not be able to be drawn, but with another process, you may be able to draw, draw it to a very fine structure, given all these glass transition temperature, uh, the melting temperature, the crystallinity, all these aspects, maybe not the crystallinity, but melting and glass transition temperature, all these aspects uh, are fixed. So you cannot change them there, but you can change something in the production process itself. And this is the most important aspect. The point is, if you take a plastic rod and if you put a weight on it, uh, it will stretch, but, as, but the moment you release it, uh, the, the plastic rod would come back. That's the elastic effect of it. But if you keep the load, uh, same load for a very long time, what eventually will happen is that uh, the plastic rod would like to forget that it was being stretched. And in that process, the, the macromolecules or the polymer chain will start to flow with respect to each other to relieve this stress. And this is what this is the creeping effect of it. Uh, if you, I'll just go back to one slide. Uh, this is the stressful graph that, that was there. Uh, so, you know, in a normal uniaxial tensile testing process, what we do, we increase the stress and see how, how strained it is, how, many, how much more it can be elongated. However, if you keep for a, for, a, for, a, for a plastic rod, if you keep the stress constant and you have it for a very long time, then eventually it will relax itself and will come to a steady state where it has relieved most of the load, most of the stress concentration in it, and uh, will elongate to, to, to an extent where, which, is, which, is, which was beyond our understanding at the very beginning. And this is, uh, this is something uh, that is going to help uh, one uh, in making nanofibers. So this is like, you know, this is what we call it as the viscoelastic effect. So it, once it flows, it's like a viscous fluid that when it flows, uh, it's like a honey, uh, but where it gets stuck or uh, the, what it should be the initial weight to, uh, to start this flow is the elastic effect. So if you take a silly putty and if you roll it on the desk and allow it to settle, what will happen that it will flatten itself. So initially you provided some shear stress uh, and in the, in the effect of viscosity, uh, you know, it starts, to, uh, it starts to flatten itself and at one point of time, it will get stuck because the elastic effects have kicked in. This net property is what we call it as viscoelastic effect. And this viscoelastic effect is actually very, very important uh, or an associated Deborah number which is written over here is actually very important. And Deborah number is, uh, is a number that is associated with the production process itself. So in the left of the slide, you see there are uh, three images. So that's a very viscous polymer solution, uh, which is which was being dropped. Uh, and and when, while it is flowing down, we get to see the viscous effect of it. So while pouring it, I'm providing shear stress. And when I'm providing this stress, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's following Newton's law, uh, which is sigma uh, into viscosity into strain rate. And in that process, it, uh, you know, it flows. So that's the viscosity or that's the viscous effect. Now with a scissor, we could cut it. And as soon as we cut it, the, the jet which was coming down goes back. And that's the elastic effect, that's the Hooke's law. So once we couple them, uh, then we get to see the image uh, on the right hand side where sigma by time is provided. And, uh, so, and this is how uh, the stress is being relaxed as molecules try to rearrange them. Well, uh, now if I, if I put some time associated with it, like 
with over what exactly what scale of time uh, the polymer uh, relaxes itself so that it forgets how it was being stretched and stays in that stays in that domain why i'm why i'm why i'm trying to say this is that if you take a drop of polymer solution uh, like polyethylene oxide and if you try to stretch it you can stretch it down to 1 micron level from a 1 mm drop you can stretch it to 1 micron a fiber and it would stay as 1 micron the question is what is the time that it takes to stay as 1 micron and that is the time we and uh, the time scale of the deformation uh, or the strain rate uh, is the uh, you know the uh, is is ts and the ratio between them is what we call it as deborah number so if deborah number is very large what it means it means a solid like behavior so a spring an ideal spring has deborah number infinite so which means you pull them uh, with whatever stress and you hold it for an infinite time and release it it will still come back as a spring but if you take water you pour it in any any uh, vessel it will take the shape of the vessel uh, it will uh, take the shape, the shape of the vessel and it has a deborah number of 0 because it doesn't have any characteristic relaxation time so all our material falls between these two maximum domains uh, in uh, the rule of thumb is that if your deborah number is greater than half then the polymer can then the polymer solution can be spun to an to a nanofiber architecture that's like uh, the practitioner's rule so uh, so if we take so how do we understand this deborah number so if we take the silly putty as i have mentioned earlier if you just release it if you roll it and release it it will spread like like a viscous material now if you take the silly putty and you uh, immediately try to stretch it it will stretch like a like a chewing gum uh, it starts to behave a bit like elastic mold then you take the silly putty and you drop it onto the surface and it will bounce um, because now your strain rate has increased and it is starting to behave like an elastic body uh, you take that same silly putty and you fire a bullet on it it will crack through it now it has started to behave like an exact solid and more like a brittle material so which means that we have to find uh, our uh, and proportion where the time of the flow or the stretching rate is optimum where characteristic relaxation time being a function of the polymer solution or the melt which is again driven by its glass transient temperature its uh, its uh, its melting temperature and its branching characteristic or its molecular weight so we need to find that viscoelasticity first of all we need to find the viscosity of it uh, so the viscous the viscosity of it we can measure by a shear geometry so we can have two plates we shear them uh, this is the famous newton's law of viscosity Uh, we can find it um, now we can have a cone plate or a parallel plate type mostly for polymers or for polymer melt we do see a shear thinning behavior so over a, as you increase the stress uh, the polymer if the polymer solution or the melt starts to flow more easily behave more like newton fluid well but just not viscosity that you want we also need to know the elasticity of it now with elongational geometry which i have shown here as a picture uh, you can actually measure the viscosity and the and the characteristic relaxation time as a measure of uh, viscoelasticity at once uh, so elongational geometry is actually not a very complex geometry uh, there is there are two small uh, plates or uh, upper plate is connected with a solenoid valve and you have a switch and the rate at which the upper plate moves is about 10 to the power 3 per second uh, so um, if you put a little bit of polymer solution between the, these two plates and it stretches and it goes up what happens as you can see in this uh, snapshot these are all taken at about 7600 frames per second uh, so it forms a small cylindrical thread between the two parallel plates uh, and these and these uh, this this thread start to thin down and as it starts to thin down it tries to hold between these two droplets and this is actually a measure of its relaxation time so how long it takes to break uh, this thread 
uh, using the uh, the uh, equation which is given of uh, of a, which is the radius of the thread, we can find lambda, which is the Cantus, uh, relaxation time over here. Theta and lambda are actually same, um, and from from this from from a very basic calculation, we can find uh, elongational viscosity as well, and from there we can find Debra number. Now the question is, why do we need to know this Debra number? As I mentioned several times. Uh, in reality, uh, you know, as a practitioner, we have seen many a times uh, that uh, we cannot spin uh, a polyacrylonitrile solution, uh, which is about four or five weight percent in dimethylformamide. Uh, it needs to be a little higher than that, about seven to eight weight percent. But if we increase the stretching, if we increase the ratio of stretching, which is mentioned here as 10 to the power seven to 10 per second, uh, then uh, you know, even though your relaxation time still stays as one millisecond uh, or maybe less than one millisecond, with a very high stretching rate, uh, you can still thin it down and make it like a fiber. So uh, if you increase Deborah number, you increase the stretchability. That means that you need to have your process time as quick as possible. So, in, and, and that is one of the reasons why in electrospinning it has a stretching ratio higher than melt, melt blowing and melt blowing is about 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 3 per second uh, in electrospinning it is about 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 4 per second and hence you do not need a polymer melt um, which is 100 weight percent you need a 20 weight percent and you can still make fiber and even nanofiber architecture so now knowing that you know in melt blowing uh, why we cannot have it uh, you know just a very brief of melt blowing is that um, melt temperature in polymer melt temp i mean the process itself is very is not um, too difficult we have an extruder uh, we have a hopper we supply the polymer melt extruder passes through a gear pump it goes through a concentric uh, die uh, where the external um, die uh, supplies the high speed air about 100 to 200 meter per second and uh, as the polymer jet comes out it's being stretched by the by the strong air and the fiber and it and it dries makes a fiber and it gets collected on a collector um, now the parameters over here is the polymer melt temperature about 30 to 50 degree more than melting temperature uh, and depending on different application, you uh, you keep the throughput. The, the, the biggest concern is the process air temperature and the process air flow rate. Uh, air temperature has to be about the same, about like melting point, because you need an isothermal condition, otherwise the fibers will break. Uh, the bottleneck of this process is the air flow rate, which is about 100 to 200 meter per second. And uh, if you go beyond this, uh, given the dye nozzle, uh, the dye design, you get the the the, uh, the dye itself get choked, and you won't be able to draw polymer fiber uh, anymore. Uh, and this is where uh, your your polymer architecture or the fiber architecture cannot become thinner. So, uh, in general, uh, melt blown fibers are on the scale of about one to hundreds or uh, about tens of micron. On an average, we get about five to ten micron of a fiber size. Of course, if you uh, take this five micron fiber and if you reduce it to one micron fiber, your surface area increases 25 times. And that is something very important. And that is where, uh, you know, electro spinning come, uh, comes in, uh, in place. Uh, now, the, now the point is that in electro spinning, uh, I believe many of you are aware of the process itself. Um, in electro spinning, what we have to keep in mind that we are I'm not going to talk about polymer melt. We are going to talk about the uh, solution, polymer solution. Even melt also, you can do the same process. Uh, now, polymer solution, it has lesser viscosity than polymer melt. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, obviously, lesser, lesser characteristic relaxation time because you have lesser concentration, less weight of the polymer. So uh, the next solution will not have as much viscoelastic effect as the polymer melt was. So, in, so now, in order to make fibers, you have to have a very strong, uh, a very strong force in particular drawing direction, and that is being uh, provided by the electric field, which is several kilovolt per centimeter. Uh, so, in this process, we take a polymer solution and we pump it with a with a syringe pump, 
uh, we connect, we have a needle through which the polymer jet comes out and we connect a very high voltage supply uh, with the nozzle uh, and the collector which can be a static and can be a drum collector and as the polymer jet comes out it experiences drag, it experiences bending instabilities and it makes fiber uh, as the solvent evaporate as well. The question over here is that why do we call it spinning? Why don't we call it spraying or why don't we call it just a simple spume? Uh, so here I will provide a bit of detail. So as the polymer solution, so this polymer itself doesn't have any positive or negative charges. And the solvent uh, is not that conductive as well. So solvents we mostly use like uh, dimethylformamide, or formic acid, acetic acid, they, they are not as conductive as uh, you know hydrochloric acid or nitric acid could be. So uh, now, uh, now you're supplying several kilovolt, like 10 to 15 or 20 kilovolt at the at the nozzle tip, and you are producing too much of positive charge. Now, as the droplet comes out, it contains that positive charge, and because of surface tension, it tries to remain as a sphere. But then the positive charges repel each other. And uh, because of the surface tension, it elongates as much as possible, making a Taylor cone. Uh, this angle of Taylor cone is about 29 to 49 degrees. Uh, degrees. So it makes a Taylor cone. Now, the, the, voltage, the electric charges are still repelling each other. And as soon as you increase the voltage, uh, then one polymer jet sh shoots out of this, of this uh, drop and, uh, and it travels in, in air and, and comes to the collector. Well, as it comes out, it comes out like a straight, uh, like a straight jet, like an arrow, and then it experiences bending instabilities. Now, what is this bending instability? Uh, you see, in our world, everything is vibrating. So, as we are talking, we are issuing air. Um, so, even in a, even in an inert and an uh, inert ambient, even in space, if we try to do this electrospinning, we we'll still get this bending instabilities because. The pump, uh, because the syringe pump is running, so it, it has its own vibration frequency that is that it allows to be traversed through this uh, through this polymer jet. And as the as the droplet becomes thinner and thinner and comes out like a fiber, uh, it and the solvent evaporates, it starts to become massless, and this vibrational frequency becomes too much for this jet uh, to uh, you know uh, to you know, to, to be kept it at as a straight jet, and eventually it starts to starts to vibrate. It starts to uh, it starts to fluctuate. So in a fluctuating jet, uh, even if you see at the at the right bottommost image, uh, if we think about a polymer macromolecule and if we take uh, three point charges A, B, and C, uh, uh, which are repelling each other, and then suddenly this slightest of this vibration, slightest of this fluctuation takes point B to point B prime. Then, even, even though it was in the, begin, I mean, in, in the beginning while it was not uh, fluctuating, point A was pushing against point B and B was pushing against point C. And so B and C were pushing against on each other and A, and A, B and C were going farther apart. Now, when B moves to B prime, A and B still uh, repels each other and B and C repels each other. At the end, uh, we get to see B prime moving towards uh, the direction of F1, and hence we start to we start to get to see a bend in the fiber fiber architecture, which you see in the in the in the bottom middlemost picture. Now, as the fluctuation is like uh, you know it's it's more or less turbulent, uh, and B prime and then other point can get ex, uh, ex, expanded on the other side as well. Eventually, this starts to this this uh, this bending, this B prime going going towards B uh, F one, uh, starts to become longer and longer, and eventually it makes a helical path, and hence it becomes spinning, and it gets collected over a collector. So as it travels through the through the air, it experiences several kind of instabilities, several kind of bending instabilities. Well, uh, now as we know, uh, you know um, the the basic of electrospinning. Where where we can where we can tweak it. First of all, if we if we get to know the viscoelastic parameters, like the characteristic relaxation time of a of a polymer solution, uh, 
uh, of, uh, in a particular solvent. Uh, solvent can be good or theta solvent or can be a bad solvent. So if we get to know the viscoelastic parameters, what we what we should do, we change the other parameters like the voltage that should be applied and this or the electric field. And this electric field will eventually draw it stronger and stronger. So um, there, you can see in articles that some some in some articles people uh, mention about the same polymer solution. They they, ex, uh, they explain the same uh, same aspect, uh, and they say we have used 10 kilo for a 10 centimeter distance, where other mention that they have used 15 or 20 kilo. What they do not mention over there was what was their surface tension and what was their viscoelastic component. So if you need a very fine architecture, you need to play with the concentration, which will in, uh, uh, evidently affect your uh, viscoelastic parameter. So if you, you measure the viscoelastic parameter, and if you know uh, what is the what is the characteristic, uh, characteristic relaxation time, you will be able to have an idea uh, that whether or not your fiber structure will, will form. If your characteristic relaxation time is in microsecond, then there is no way you will be able to make fibers and nanofibers. But if it's in the order of millisecond, you will be able to make fibers. If it is in the order of seconds, then yes, you will be able to make fibers. Uh, if your collector is very close to the to the needle, then probably you will have a very thick fiber. And this fiber, as it will come, it will hit the surface and it will relax and it will thicken. So instead of making a nanofiber, you'll start to make microfiber. So then you need to increase the needle to collector distance and allow the fiber to be uh, to be stretched as much as possible. Now with electro spinning, uh, I have mentioned it earlier that you won't be getting uh, you know as crystalline structure as you may get in maybe blood, or you may get in in uh, in spun body. You won't be getting the same crystalline structure in electro spinning. Uh, if you increase the voltage, if you increase the electric field, you may get a stress induced crystallization uh, where you still have a solid fiber and you are still drawing it on the expense of a liquid domain. Uh, and then you will get a completely solidified crystalline domain, a 100% crystalline domain, but that will look like a shish kebab kind of a structure. So uh, now knowing uh, this, you know, let's go to the application. Um, the parameters I have already mentioned, you know, um, the process parameters are very important. Often cases, you know, we um, we end up uh, at least in the in the academic level. I do definitely know um, if not in tens of lakhs, where all the conditions are being are in our control. Uh, and when we say all the conditions, I'm talking about humidity and the and the temperature of the ambient. So if you can control humidity and ambient you can get more or less same kind of fiber architecture if you have if you are doing electro spinning in a humid condition uh, remember uh, that your fiber will be thicker because the solvent is not evaporating if in outside temperature is too high uh, then eventually you will break the fiber in the flight and you will get thicker fiber once again so these are the parameters that need to be known but probably the most important factor is the viscoelasticity or your ability to stretch the polymer into a make into making a nanofiber. Now, uh, the application of these nanofibers are tremendous. As I mentioned, tissue engineering, air water purification, uh, in alternate energy, in uh, drug delivery applications, packaging, food packaging, everywhere. Uh, I have provided three examples. Uh, one is drug delivery. Uh, this is one of the areas which I have worked during my PhD. Uh, this was uh, this is actually if you, this is a drug release profile. Uh, so we take uh, pills uh, within eight hours or twelve hours. These pills need to be retaken uh, to maintain a static drug level in our body. But if you have a nanofiber architecture which contains the drug, and you can tweak the nanofiber individual fiber architecture so that a same quantity of drug can be released over a period of time, uh, then it becomes really, really useful. Nowadays, there are many hydrogels, uh, there are many pills which are coming, which are written as uh, you know, sustained release, release. But probably with these kind of architecture, you can get the sustained release concept, uh, concept more feasible manner. 
So this work was uh, was about releasing an antibacterial drug, cyprofloxacin, uh, for periodontal diseases. Uh, when the drug need to be released for about uh, 15 to 20 days. We released it for about 28 days. Here the data shows for 16. Uh, and we sh and you can see in this graph that uh, every day about same percentage of drug we were releasing. Uh, now in tissue engineering application, this is one area uh, where, um, uh, you know, th uh, where, till where um, uh, this group had shown tremendous result. What they did, they made a PCL, polycaprolactin, collagen mixed, uh, um, uh, nanofibrous artery, and they bypassed from uh, you know this uh, this iliac artery. They they cut it out. They placed their own artery there, and uh, have st still seen uh, you know blood flow happening over a period of time, and eventually cells growing on them. So um, this nanofiber architecture actually allows uh, to uh, like to mimic an extracellular uh, matrix where cells can grow and attach easily. On the other hand, uh, you know, this is one, uh, one area which we are working right now to make uh, fuel cell um, electrodes. So we are, what we are doing is to make uh, fuel cell or to, to make electrode materials out of these nanofibers, um, uh, which can be used for hydrogen generation and can be also useful for fuel cell. Especially for uh, you know, when I was showing the face mask, the reason uh, to avoid several layers of melt clone uh, is that melt clone architecture blocks the flow and increases more, uh, you know, pressure or increases pressure drop drastically. Whereas in a nanofiber architecture, because of the increased toxicity uh, and because of many fibers present, but they are in nanofibers, so it reduces, it induces slip flow. It reduces the resistance to flow and increases particle capturing. So the same effect can be actually obtained with a single nanofiber layer, which was you know initially which I showed uh, you know, during my presentation. So um, now the thing is that you know uh, this is the end slide. Um, uh, students, especially students, if you are working in non-woven area, if you are working in the polymer fiber area, remember that the opportunities. Uh, are tremendous. The applications that are tremendous. I tell all my students all the time that you know, a person who is who is working in, in civil engineering uh, um, and he's working in probably soil stability or something. He works in or he or she works in soil stability, but um, he can never work with. He will. He or she will not know that you can you know increase the soil stability as well using geotextile. But, but uh, and especially that soil stability person will not be able to speak to a filtration person, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, or, an, or, an, or, an, or a pores media flow uh, specialist, but you can talk to the same pores media uh, flow specialist because you, that same architecture can be used for uh, porous media flow as well. So, uh, so in short, the applications are tremendous, uh, the nano non wovens are there to be to, to grow. The market is huge, uh, especially in the modern scenario where uh, face masks, respirators, etc., are having tremendous uh, need in our in our day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, I believe that's high time uh, that we all learn about the basics of it. We'll all learn about the integrities of it, and we use them. We learn to use them, uh, uh, and um, we we explore more. Uh, regarding uh, nano non -workers. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to end here. Uh, now, you know, I will uh, take your questions. If you have any, please do let me. Thank you. Shaleji. Uh, Shaleji. <coughs> I urgent request the faculty and students to uh, present to uh, they must right. they, I'm sure they must have gained from this uh, very insightful lecture. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, uh, the students, they are welcome to uh, they can unmute their mic and ask the question or the faculty members. Faculty may have Dr. Mukesh. 
सर फैकल्टी में है अभी लेकिन आज से आई थिंक या इट वाज अ वेरी नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन बाय डॉक्टर रे आई थिंक इट विल बी वेरी यूजफुल फॉर आवर स्टूडेंट्स एंड फॉर फैकल्टी मेंबर्स सम ऑफ द टॉपिक्स आर आल्सो यू नो इंक्लूडेड इन आवर सिलेबस कोर्स करिकुलम स्पेशली यूनिट 3 और यूनिट 4 Uh, I am sure many questions will be asked by our faculty uh, students. So, uh, can you uh, you know throw some light about the utility? Like you have uh, spoken about the the nano fiber based non-oven or electro spinning techniques. Now, how it is uh, it will be different from like spanless? You see the present scenario point of view. You have shown the uh, utility point of view. So, mm -hmm. how it is uh, different from the spanless and the hydro entangled uh, non-ovens and uh, other needle punch? Because needle punch non-ovens are also widely used. Yeah. Can you throw some light? Yes. So, um, well, I would first of all I would apologize about one thing is that um, you know I am not a textile engineer, so I won't be able to talk about the uh, you know details of the process itself. But what I would say is that. Uh, the area where it differentiates, where it is, uh, where the nano non ovens are more important than these, are the very basic of surface area to volume ratio. So practically, you can have the same, you can have a lesser grammage as you make as you make an architecture. You can have a lesser grammage, but can cover the, uh, but can cover the same surface area. Now, the, you, know, uh, you see, I have one. Uh, uh, Innovation or one objection uh, to textile specialists when they talk about GSM, and uh, specifically the GSM they mention is about the physical surface area. So it's like one meter by one meter. That's what we tend to generally uh, address. But the fact is that uh, if our if our application is based on fluid and body interaction, so if it is about absorption or if it is about filtration. Then the real surface area is inside, and it is not the physical surface area as we see it. Uh, now, in the nano non ovens, the physical surface area will be tremendous; it will be much much larger than anything else. So, just think about it: if you have a one micron size, if you have a one micron uh, uh, diameter, um, you know, melt loads are like five microns, some less are like 25, 50 microns. Porosities are huge. Unless and until you increase the GSM to a drastic level. So, if you have a five micron diameter of a fiber, uh, uh, you can have a length of one centimeter. So, you have five micron and one centimeter. But then you can have hundred nanometer of a fiber, and you can incorporate fifty fibers in that same five micron. Now, of course, the point is that when your fluid was coming, and you had you have had one fiber in front of the fluid. And your surface area is only the cross, only pi d uh, pi d square by four. But now you have fifty fibers oriented in the same pi micron uh, constriction, and then the chances of interaction actually increases drastically. And in those cases, fluid retainment, uh, ion separation, or uh, you know salt separation, dust loading capacity, these increases drastically. So. Uh, I, I believe most of you are aware of the story about how these nanofibers actually came into business. It was actually from Donaldson uh, in about 1983s when uh, when U.S. troops were engaged in in, in uh, Afghanistan. They couldn't, you know, the tanks were going and they couldn't see each other. Uh, they, they, according to, I mean, of, of course, you United States believe that you know uh, all this, all the world is like similar to them. So they didn't uh, anticipate this problem. They didn't anticipate. So they had like multiple tanks following each other, and then they couldn't see, uh, you know, the leading tank. Then they uh, then they contacted Donaldson uh, for making air filters, which can capture the dust. And that is where the nanofiber boom actually started. Uh, you know, so which means that it has a large dust loading capacity. And that is where it is different. Uh, Doctor Ray, there is another question. Uh, yeah. uh, you can read in the chat room. Uh, there is one gentleman in Hal Sharma. Becomes flat. What factors make this happen? It's a time effect or some parameter change. Uh, 
Yes, it's actually a very good question. You know, often cases we do, when we do electrospinning, uh, we actually get to see ribbon-like fibers. Uh, ribbon-like, um, and um, uh, I, of course, I won't be able to draw it. So please let me know if you don't get to see my hand gesture. So in a single nanofiber, often cases, we do get to see structure like two balls and then uh, a flat layer in between them. So it's like what we call it as a collapsed architecture. So it's a collapsed architecture or a ribbon-like structure. Uh, so there are many things that we do get to see. So this happens uh, because of two reasons. One, if you have some solvent left in your structure, okay? So if you have like a core shell type, type of structure, you have two visible polymers and uh, you know, what happens is one of the one of the polymer solvent uh, evaporates quickly, other doesn't. In that case, when it hits the surface, it the structure just collapses. It just loses the, whatever the solvent it was there, and it squeezes onto each other. That is one of the cases. The other case is when the uh, when the polymer fiber uh, is coming, you know, in flight, and you have uh, the uh, the collector placed at a very high distance. So in that case, the polymer, which is already solidified, and you have a very, and in this case also you are applying very high voltage, it, the, the fiber dashes onto the surface. So as it dashes onto the surface, then it experiences whatever stretch, it, whatever stress it was carrying, it didn't relax in the flight, and it hits the surface, and then it relaxed. Now, as it relaxes, since it was not solidified completely as it relaxes, the polymer macromolecule starts to flow sideways. So, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in polymer, the macromolecules can move in three directions. Either it can go up and down, it can go like this, or it can, it can rock like this. Okay. So, uh, when it hits, the polymer macromolecule just moves sideways. And in that case, the entire individual fabric or fibril within a fiber starts to move further away and then it becomes flat. So one way to avoid, so this happens in a monolithic fiber, it's not necessarily in a core shell kind of fiber. So in this case, what we generally do, uh, we make sure that our polymer fibers are dry and they are not coming wet onto the, onto the, onto the collector. So either we add some solvent which evaporates quickly or we keep our nozzle to die uh, uh, distance in an optimum fashion. Sir, another question. Yeah. Uh, why the bulk production is challenging for the nanofiber? Any update towards bulk production? Okay. Uh, so, of course, I mean, uh, there are a few companies. Um, one of them is placed in, in Tehran. Uh, there's D Marco. Uh, sorry, El Marco. <laughs> El Marco is there. Uh, there's FNM. Uh, there is one company based in Pakistan as well, uh, and of course there is there there is one in India, East Spain. There are many uh, who are trying to produce in bulk. But one thing that we do have to understand is that, you know, making nanofiber is um, yeah, it's like it's a it's like uh, you are so melt blowing is like making charcoal, uh, and and making polymer and making electrostatic nanofiber is like making graphene. So graphene, you have to make it precise. You have to do all these, you know, uh, uh, instrumentation, etc. That will automatically reduce the amount of amount of production. Uh, because in the other case, it is more or less like a crude production. Thing. That is one thing. The if you're talking about electrospun, then uh, you know solvent evaporation is one important aspect that needs to be taken care of. Uh, even if you do melt spinning, uh, you have to have many other operational conditions which are different than uh, uh, than melt doing. Um, plus, the pumping capability, uh, that is one thing that limits it, its production. Uh, and yes, there are, you know, uh, in, in, in bulk scale production, uh, I have personally seen one video which was shared by FNM uh, from Tehran. Uh, they are able to produce quite a large scale of the, you know, of the rolls, but they're doing a polymer solution electrospinning and the polymer is 
uh, solution electrospinning will be always one fifth or one fourth of milk milk. So, uh, I mean, that is the biggest challenge. We cannot really go beyond that unless and until we incorporate many more nozzles than a standard milk clone dye, which is about 2600 to about 1000, uh, to about 10,000 nozzles. Unless and until you do go as much. Uh, the then, rate of flow and high voltage are two proportionate factors. Does they have any significant effect over the drawn fibers? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, if you increase the flow rate, what happens is that uh, the voltage that you are supplying uh, won't be sufficient to produce as many positive charge or negative charge onto it. So, uh, you know, those have to be uh, those have to be optimized. If you increase the flow rate, and if you do not increase the voltage, then then uh, what may happen, you will be seeing dripping. Uh, if your nozzle to collector distance is not then increased, you will see droplets spraying onto the architecture, first of all. Now, you have increased flow rate, and you have imp uh, you know ill-proportionately increased the voltage as well, then what will happen? Uh, the fiber in flight will try, will start to break, and it will it will simply the droplet will simply uh, burst, and will create many jets, and uh, you will be seeing the effects of flies and shots forming in the in this in this architecture. So uh, it is always better uh, to you know not to just go with a very high flow rate. Um, in my personal practice, practice, I use about 0.8 millimeter of a of a of a, of a needle or a nozzle. Uh, keep a flow rate about maximum of two ml per hour, and uh, generally, um, in most of my cases, because I do a lot of electro spinning, most of my cases about eight to fifteen kilovolt is more than sufficient for me. But uh, if you are using a, a you know bought I, bought instrument. Uh, like uh, Fab India and other instrument makers, they make this electrospinning instrument uh, for a price of about 20 lakhs. Uh, we build it in our inst institute at about price of 60,000. So uh, you, you, there, you do not have the capability to change in during the process. Once you change it, you have to shut down everything. But uh, I would rather suggest that you know if you get to do it every any time. You do it by hand. You change it every time and record it. But uh, uh, the fun fact over here is that whatever you do today may not be possible to do tomorrow. Because every other property is not just the flow rate and voltage, temperature and humidity also has its effect. Sir, another question? Yeah. In commercial uh, sense, what would be the cost of production of electro spoon? To melt blonde non wooner we can do electrospoon in polypropene and polymer. Yeah. Well, uh, electrospinning, uh, if you, you know, uh, see the point is in electrospinning, the major cost, I mean, the dye uh, designing is a, you know, the, the, uh, the trickiest part over there. In electrospinning, there is no hot air involved. There is no melting involved. Uh, solvent extraction becomes the problem. So um, I would not say that you know the cost of production. I, I, it's it's a it's a comparison between apple and orange practically. Uh, because uh, you see, uh, the point is, I mean, it, uh, I I don't know how to put it, but um, it would seem like you are going to a you are going to a cheap uh, uh, cheap restaurant. And uh, you are, you are giving them you know ten rupees. You are giving them a price of a of a vada pao and then asking for a biryani. Uh, so yes, electro spinning in that sense will be costlier than melt blowing. Now, electro spinning a polypropylene mem membrane, uh, poly uh, polypropylene. If you melt it, yes, you can do it in a melt spinning process. And melt spinning is commercially possible. Okay, another question, sir. Okay. Surface tension of water is too high. Thus, uh, what is the exact solvent propostage to be used along with the monomer? Used to prevent it? 
for dripping directly without additional force okay uh, first of all uh, you know for electrospinning water is a very bad solvent we tend not to do it um, if we have to uh, use a green solvent we generally tell them like we are using dmf uh, dmf doesn't do much of a you know it won't do ma majorly a great you know changes in your body uh, but we try to avoid uh, you know water yes the surface tension of water is too high that is one of the problems now uh, the question of exact solvent proportion to be used along with the monomer used uh, for, i mean we generally don't use the monomer we you know use the polymer for, uh, first of all uh, and the solvent um, you need to study uh, you know uh, i mean see formic acid is like a theta solvent for for uh, for uh, polyvinyl alcohol it's like a theta solvent and when you say theta solvent that is the best solvent you at least need to use a good solvent uh, you cannot use a bad solvent like uh, uh, dmf dimethyl formamide is a, is not a solvent for polyvinyl alcohol so you won't be able to use it so uh, now acetic acid is a good solvent but it's not a theta solvent for polyvinyl alcohol now if you are using say nylon six then formic acid is a good solvent a mixture of formic acid and, uh, and acetic acid 50 50 because acetic acid is more benign than formic uh, is going to make it as a good solvent not a theta but uh, but again uh, you know uh, uh, generally and commonly available nylon 6 uh, you, you won't be able to mix more than 25% in in a in a you know in, in even though even though it's a very good solvent you won't be able to mix more than that so this uh, you know this is something that um you have to study literature and you have to also have to practice thank you sir thank you thanks a lot thank you for you know, having me and i you know if you have any any others have questions you may forward them to me by email yeah i will share with you yeah uh next is roji uh, if you want to talk something sorry vinod ji vinod ji oh okay yeah chalesh ji ha ji is there any want to have talk with the doctor ray uh no not exactly i shan bark sir is also there vinod shan bark ji uh ji uh, i'd like to thank doctor ray for a wonderful uh, and uh, very well explained lecture Uh, thank you. I think it's been a fantastic presentation. That thank you, Doctor Ray, and I look forward to seeing you again. Sure, sure. Thank you, Vinod ji. Thank you for your remarks. I take this opportunity. Uh, sometimes uh, there was some interest uh, received by one of the senior faculty, senior faculty members. I think Shailesh was uh, more aware. Uh, about uh, cooperation and collaboration between this and uh, uh, IIT Bharti. So uh, I would just like to uh, say that we are interested to take this forward, and I look forward to our cooperation. Sir, at individual level, I am in touch with uh, Dr. Ray, and we are developing some prototypes, some patents, some innovations, and of course, IIT Mandi. Uh, i would uh, again request uh, dr ray how we can institutionalize our uh, relationship that i will again take up with dr ray okay excuse me there is another question i think in the chat box in case yeah, i got it sir i got it oh bata do ek baar sir dr ray is there any process to reduce the melting temperature of a polymers like a pva in electrospinning since melting might take a lot of time well uh, okay uh that you can i mean uh, one can use uh, you know low molecular weight polymer low molecular weight ppa um uh, pva is uh, you know you will be able to find many molecular weights actually so all the way from 30000 kda to about 180 to 200000 kda 
so one way of seeing it is you take a lesser molecular weight PVA and you will, you know, reduce the melting temperature. Uh, not you will not reduce the melting temperature. You will reduce the time required for melting. Now um, the other, I mean, honestly speaking, if you have some metallic particle or something associated with it, uh, you know, uh, then you may reduce the heat required for melting temperature. Or to, sorry, to heat uh, to heat required for melting. I mean, you cannot actually reduce the melting temperature. It's an intrinsic property of that particular molecular structure. So you won't be able to reduce it, but you can reduce the time required for it or the heat required for it if you have some uh, you know reinforcing agent like maybe graphene or carbon uh, or maybe some metallic part, or if you take a different uh, molecular weight altogether. Uh, of course, you can reduce the degree of hydrolyzation. That is one more thing that can that can help. But um, again, there is no straightaway answer for reducing the melting temperature because melting temperature is an intrinsic property of that part. Uh, best uh, best way of doing it is by taking a just a you know smaller molecular weight. Uh, Dr. Ray, can I ask a question? A few questions and make sure. few comments. Sure. Uh, this uh, electro spinning does it find a usage in uh, graphene manufacture, graphene based electrode uh, sensors? Yes. So uh, even in even in your even I mean, it won't be like electro spinning. Then it will be more like electro spring, uh, where you can actually spray uh, graphene suspended uh, you know solution. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the other, I mean, one of our, my work was actually having carbon drop mm -hmm. uh, and then spinning polycapro electron with carbon black to make uh, a conductive transparent electrode. Mm -hmm. uh, used, and, and the basic use for it was uh, to make a glass heater, uh, mm -hmm. especially for cold air, cold region, uh, and then making a room warm using glass heater. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, if you, if I mean carbon black, where carbon black maximum size was about five micron, with mm -hmm. graphene, with you know, if you, if it is uh, nano scale, mm -hmm. nanometer, uh, it is very easy to incorporate and to spin it, and you can, I think, I believe there are applications involving smart textile. Uh, so people are trying to you know incorporate that into woven uh, shirts, mm -hmm. but uh, if you want to have a small patch of it. And incorporate in your, you know, uh, in a book, in your pocket, or maybe on your skin somewhere, or use it like a bandage. Uh, actually, actually I was looking uh, two applications of this in mind. Mm -hmm. One is high altitude uh, clothing for sea urchin like uh, yes. yes area yes. where yes. if you have a thin clothing with the nano spun graphene, which can be sort of artificially matlab, heated. Yeah. Uh, being still being smaller in size, that was one idea. The other was if I can have a tattoo-like sticker for a EEG kind of thing. EEG is that electro exactly. uh, echocardiograph. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Your brain uh, Exactly. Uh, pulses. So uh, that is, technically, that's possible. Yes, it is technically possible, and it, it has been it has been done actually. So in, you see, the best part of what you just mentioned about uh, this Siachen kind of situations, mm -hmm. is that there are jackets available right now where you know I have seen it in, in Chicago several times. Mm -hmm. Bikers use this jacket. They mm -hmm. uh, you know in their pocket they have a small battery. They just clip it with the jacket, and mm -hmm. uh, as you know uh, as they ride they. And all of these have actually metallic wires in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, so most the the issue, issue there is that it's minus 40, even if you put a trigger or put a uh, touch a screw or a nut or a bolt, mm -hmm. you are exposed to that temperature. And a thicker clothing will make it difficult to handle. Exactly. So thinner exactly. clothing, if it, there is a thinner clothing, micron size clothing, mm -hmm. it could still be hot, uh, that I think would be preferred. No, exactly. Yes. So what it could do, what you could do is you can, you can build it like a resistance heater. Mm -hmm. Even polymer melts at a much lower temperature than metals. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you even if you short circuit somewhere, mm -hmm. and 
if it, if your you know your temperature increases drastically mm -hmm. what would happen is that your polymer will melt and uh, you know the circuit will be broken Mm -hmm. In that case, you will not be exposed to a very high uh, temperature or, you know, uh, burning kind of situation. Mm -hmm. That is the, probably the best part of using polymer fiber with, you know, conductive ink mm -hmm. or conductive component on the fiber itself. And you mm -hmm. can weave it on there. Or you can have patches uh, glued on, on washer. Are there any more questions or can we wind up? I see two more in the chat. Yes. Uh, Doctor, can you? Yes, I can actually see it. Uh, there was one question which um, Ashish Chauhan has written is about a uh, difference between smart textile and a technical textile. Well, uh, I mean, when we associate the term smart, I believe, you know, we associate it with always with, uh, you know, uh, um, some kind of intelligence level. So uh, in, in that as aspect, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever me and uh, Kaushik we were discussing, these are all smart textiles. And technical, technical textile is even your face wipe is a technical textile. So probably that's the difference, only difference. Uh, all smart textiles are technical textiles and not necessarily all technical textiles are smart ones. Uh, I believe that answers your question. And the other question which I have seen, which I'm seeing here is that given the low level of low crystallinity, how one can think of stability of nanofiber? Well, uh, the stability of nanofiber is, uh, you know, is is not of that of a big problem actually, because uh, what we have seen in uh, you know in DST. So when we, when we do differential scanning calorimetry, we uh, we practically melt the polymer fiber, and in often cases uh, when we do DST, we do not take the first cycle data. We take about three or fifth, third or fifth cycle data. Uh, and in those cases, um, it has been seen that even after melting and then solidifying and then remelting, during that time, the fiber remains in a fibrous architecture. So the stability is there. Now, uh, if, you, if you control your stretchability, you can incorporate a bit of crystallinity and that should take care uh, from the moisture aspect. But you see, nylon is hygroscopic in any sense. I mean, even if it has 50% uh, for crystallinity, it still has 50% nano crystallinity. Uh, and it will still contain, you know, 50% area which can still absorb a bit of water moisture. So uh, stability is, is not a big concern uh, in terms of crystallinity or amorphousness. Well, the biggest concern will come um, if you are incorporating some form of, you know, if you are thinking about dissolving it, uh, like polyvinyl alcohol, if you're making a water filter out of polyvinyl alcohol, then that would be a very difficult proposition because it, because it dissolves in water. So uh, then you have to heat treat it and increase the crystalline to make it insoluble in water. So, uh, so if you have to, you know, I mean, you have to figure out where you are going to use. Like PVDF nanofibers are, you know, even though they have, even though they may have less crystallinity, they're still quite uh, inert uh, with respect to hydrochloric acid uh, or, or nitric acid. Uh, if there are no more questions, can you wrap up? Uh, can we wrap up the discussion? Yeah, sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot again. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod Pushanbhav, sir. Thank you, K. N. Chatterjee, sir. Thanks, Dr. Ray. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, I appreciate. You know, thank you.